Hello, this is Dr. Ed Kim from the UCSF Department of Surgery. In this podcast, we'll go over the use of radiographic studies in the evaluation of patients with acute abdominal pathology. The main learning goal of this session is to change the way you think about radiographic studies. Most novices view CT scans, MRIs, and even plain films as data that is inaccessible without the interpretation from a certified radiologist. However, in reality, clinicians, especially surgeons, read and interpret scans all the time. We may not have the official credentials, but most of us are fairly competent and will make clinical decisions based on what we see along with official read from the radiologist. For example, I would never go to the operating room without looking at the pertinent films myself. Reading the official report alone would not be sufficient. So in your training, it is imperative that you develop basic reading skills for CTs, MRIs, and plain films. So what does this mean with regard to our relationship with radiologists? For me, I still rely on them for all the final reads to ensure that I haven't missed anything subtle. They are, after all, the experts. But it is a collaborative relationship where I discuss complex cases as well as any discrepancies between what I see and what the official read is. They have greater expertise in reading films and I have the greater clinical insight. Working together, we are likely to get the most accurate interpretation. So please don't misinterpret what I'm trying to teach you in this session is that you can read CT scans, MRIs on your own, but that having a functional understanding actually will help you and your radiology colleagues get the most out of this very important modality. And the key detail we'll be discussing in this session is radiographic evidence of inflammation. So what does inflammation look like? On physical exam, there's swelling, redness, and heat and pain. More commonly seen or taught as dolor, calor, rubor, and tumor. What about on x-rays? What can we detect? Well, a CT scan is not going to tell you whether the patient is having pain, or if the foot feels hot, or whether the skin overlying it is red. Most commonly used radiographic studies are visual modalities that are limited to de detect detecting changes in sizes, shapes, and densities. In the setting of inflammation, it can really, really only tell you if there's swelling. So in this case of a sprained ankle, an x-ray would not be really necessary to tell you that there's inflammation or not. You can see it just with your own eyes, feel it with your hands, and hear the patient's story with your own ears. I know I'm stating the obvious, obvious here, but the real value for a swollen ankle is really to show us what's un underneath, whether there is a broken bone or if there are torn ligaments. The situation is a little bit different with the abdomen. In the context of trauma, the idea would still be the same. We're trying to see what's going on inside and assess organ injury. But for a lot of the acute abdominal processes that developed in, into acute peritonitis, it is the detection of inflammation, especially in the early stages, that is of paramount importance. It's critical for making early diagnosis and in many cases to pr uh, critical for dis making decisions about treatment. For a sprained ankle, however, the accompanying inflammation has little bearing on how we would treat it. For a bowel obstruction, for example, it can mean the difference between going to the operating room, it being the presence of inflammation, that is. If there is inflammation, it can be the difference between going to the operating room versus watching the patient with NG, uh, nasogastric tube suction and IV fluids uh, support. Here are two scans that illustrate what inflammation looks on a scan. A young man with lower abdominal pain and tender tenderness has a differential diagnosis that includes acute appendicitis, gastroenteritis, mesenteric adenitis, and, and, and several other uh, diagnoses. The presence of inflammation in the appendix secures the diagnosis. On the right, you can see that there is swelling, a swollen appendix, and on the le uh, excuse me, on the left, there is a swollen appendix. On the right, for comparison, is a normal unswollen appendix. Now what I'm presenting is a relatively simplistic model, but it's a good start to help you begin to build a foundation on how to think about radiographic studies. Uh, but to further better understand, or at least to gain a uh, deeper um, view of what we're talking about, we need to review 
the pathophysiology of inflammation. So what causes swelling and inflammation? Well, the swelling is actually due to water. It's due to edema. Edema is secondary to uh, effect of leaky capillaries from the release of histamines and prostaglandins. The leaky capillaries are necessary to deliver leukocytes and other elements that respond to the insult or injury. So when we're looking at swelling on the scans, we're actually looking for edema and water that shouldn't be where they uh, are, are, are. As we will see in the next slide, both CT MRIs are particularly good at detecting presence of edema. We'll actually focus mostly on CTs, by the way, or exclusively. So let's look at, uh, so these principles apply generally to tomographic studies. Scans detect differences in tissue density. The least dense is air, which is black, and the most dense is bone, which is typically white. Or if there's a metallic object, it would even be more so. All other tissues lie somewhere between. Muscle is denser than fat, so it's light gray. Fat is dark gray because it's lighter than muscle. Water is somewhere between muscle and uh, fat, typically. These intrinsic differences in density are further highlighted, or, or highlighted, excuse me, in non-contrast CT, which is shown on the right. We can further enhance the details by injection of dense molecules in the vasculature, which highlights these differences in perfusion. So sol solid organs that are well perfused, such as the liver or the kidney, appear brighter than skeletal muscles, which are not as well perfused as the rest. And the differential perfusion, even among the organs, will also help uh, show the diff, uh, show, uh, provide contrast so you can see them. And so you can see an IV contrast study on the right, which is obvious, has much, obviously has much more detail. Oral and rectal contrast can further highlight the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract and provide additional detail. And you can see that also on the right scan, which is a, appears to be a IV contrast CT with oral contrast as well. And rectal contrast, it's, uh, it's it doesn't seem like uh, there is, it's there because uh, the colon does not have any contrast in it. So to detect inflammation, we look for excess water due to leaky capillaries. This excess water can be seen in multiple places in, multi in different shapes. One place is interstitial edema of the surrounding fat that is affected by the adjacent, infl adjacent inflammation. So basically there's a spillover of these uh, vasoactive uh, factors that also causes leaky capillaries within the fat. This water in the fat leads to an increased density in com compared to normal fat. Normal fat doesn't have that much water and water is more dense than fat. Since the edema percolates in the space unevenly, there are streaks of water and this is called fat stranding. And you can see that on the left of the acute appendicitis, and you can see that on the right, which is an acute diverticulitis. You can, uh, a good examples of fat stranding. So this is, these are two scans of small bowel obstructions. And you can see, so on the right is a bowel obstruction without uh, wall thickening in the small bowel. The small bowel wall is actually normal thickness and on the left it is abnormally thickened. So it's edema within the organ itself. Okay, And in the, the yellow uh, uh, arrow highlights an, another type of edema which is free fluid within the peritoneal cavity. So this is edema or water that's leaked out from the organ and from the surrounding structures into the peritoneal cavity itself. And looking at these two scans, you can guess which scan has uh, a more advanced um, stage of bowel obstruction based on the uh, um, degree of inflammation and the edema. So to review, there are three cardinal signs of intra-abdominal inflammation or, or edema. First is the fat stranding, which we saw in the interstitium of adjacent fatty tissue. Second is wall thickening, edema within the wall of the organ. And third is free fluid, which is basically exudative ascites, edema spilled out into the peritoneal cavity. Now let's apply some of the things we've learned. Here is a scan of normal gallbladder on the left with thin walls and no other signs of edema. Now look at the, uh, the gallbladder on the right. What do you see in terms of evidence of inflammation? Basically, 
what types of edema do you see or what manifestations of edema do you see? So there is clearly fat stranding with the hazy, streaky uh, uh, water uh, that is seen around the pericholecystic fat. And then at the bottom, you can see the, that there's actually even uh, so much fluid that there's, it actually has collected into a bit of free fluid um, at the bottom. The gallbladder wall itself appears to be normal at the top of the scan, but if you look on the right, there is a hazy thickening uh, of the wall on the right, uh, medial, on the medial aspect of the gallbladder. So this gallbladder shows all three attributes of uh, inflammatory edema. Now we see the coronal view of the acute appendicitis you saw early on, um, on the left. And now remember, we focused on the swelling. Now look at the scan again more carefully, and and now I hope that you can appreciate the additional findings that suggest inflammation, uh, more so than just the swollen uh, appendix itself. You can see clearly that there is some fat stranding around there. And this fat stranding is very important, especially in the early diagnosis. On the right um, scan, you can see a patient with early acute appendicitis, and you can see that the fat stranding can be very subtle, and the thickening of the appendix can also be somewhat borderline or subtle. And oftentimes, the the subtle fat stranding is the earliest manifestation and the one that you notice the first on CT scans. And this actually is one of the reasons why CT scans for really skinny people without that much fat can sometimes be difficult because there just isn't that much fat to appreciate fat stranding. Next, we have two scans of acute pancreatitis. The scan on the left is a non-contrast CT and the one on the right is with IV contrast. They're two different patients, but you can appreciate that on non-contrast CTs, you can still see fat stranding and free fluid to some degree. Um, so it's not completely unreasonable to get a non-contrast CT to look for inflammation. Obviously, with IV contrast, you get better uh, details and imaging so that it can help you. So in the, as a rule of thumb, we typically do get IV contrast as a rule unless they have... Uh, problems, uh, renal insufficiency, and are at risk for contrast nephropathy. Now, I've said that uh, to, to this point, or I've held the position that, uh, to this point that radiographic studies can really only detect swelling and edema as findings of inflammation. But this really isn't completely true. And I'm not just referring to PET scans and functional MRIs, which are a, a are exceptions in that they detect metabolic activity. But IV contrast actually can detect the increased increase in perfusion or vascular engorgement that can occur in the setting of inflammation. So basically you can actually detect the redness and the heat in some ways. So the calor and the rubor of inflammation. It's not as reliable or it's not necessarily always apparent. So in this scan of a small bowel obstruction, the yellow points to vascular uh, or venous congestion, which in indicates engorgement. And the green arrow uh, shows hyperenhancement of the bowel wall due to hyperemia of the bowel wall. And then the red actually shows a decreased perfusion or lack of perfusion actually in the bottom red arrow, which is very concerning in, in, the, sense, in the presence of bowel obstruction. And this is actually uh, the progression from the bowel on the left potentially, the, excuse me, the bowel on the right of the scan, left of the patient, but right of the scan, which looks uh, very um, poorly perfused, may have looked like the bowel on the right of the scan several hours earlier or a uh, day or, or, or uh, 24 hours earlier. So it's a progression into hypoperfusion with increased uh, inflammation and um, a lack of perfusion. And then lastly, we have a scan of acute diverticulitis, which also, you also saw earlier as part of the fat stranding example. Now look more carefully. You can see that 
In addition to fat stranding, there's also actually increased vascularity and hyperemia as well, further supporting the evidence of inflammation in this part of the sigmoid colon. So at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if you're overwhelmed about learning uh, abdominal radiology and abdominal ana anatomy. Um, but don't worry, the level of detail you need to know is not to the level of minutia or not to the level of detail that you had to learn in your gross anatomy. You don't have to identify vagus nerves, palanchnic nerves. You don't have to know the names of all the abdominal wall muscles or even what the, where this or what the cisterna chili looks like, because these are either irrelevant in terms of clinical uh, decision making process, or um, they may be beyond the level of detection for most of our studies. So what you really only need to, need to know is you need to know the gross intra-abdominal organs, as well as the retroperitoneal organs, their blood supply, and the major blood vessels. If you can recognize these organs and their location, and you're able to translate it from the textbook to the actual scans, and do it over and over, over again, you will get the rudimentary basics, or you will start to develop the foundation with which you can learn to continue to grow and become a better clinician. And on surgical services, there are two main opportunities for you to practice. First is preoperative imaging studies. If a patient has an imaging study before going to the operating room, for example, in the case of colon cancer or rectal cancer or any of these operations, there's usually a, a, a CT scan or an MRI. You should be able to view those studies or you should view those studies and practice where the organs are, where the vessels are. And also on inpatient post-op studies, oftentimes on a busy service, there are going to be scans ordered on a nearly uh, daily basis pretty much for patients who may be off trajectory and you and your team should spend really spend uh, uh, 10 minutes or so or more depending on the time that uh, you guys have for basically x-ray rounds where you can practice and become more adept at reading a films so in summary clinicians can and should develop functional proficiency in reading radiographic studies this allows us to have a more collaborative and fruitful relationship with our radiology colleagues. And by no means are we saying we're re replacing their expertise. Secondly, cardian, cardinal sign of inflammation is edema. Edema presents itself in several ways, either as uh, organ wall thickening, free fluid, or fat, fat stranding or in the adjacent fat, fatty uh, tissue. Hyperemia is re less reliable, but also can be helpful in specific cases. And lastly, it's important as a skill that you need to practice, practice, practice in order to get better at reading films and improving your abilities as a clinician. The classroom activities that will accompany this podcast will focus on small bowel obstruction, the pathophysiology that we've discussed previously, and looking at the importance of early signs and detection in order to be better clinicians and surgeons. Thank you very much.